ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, um, uh, good evening, good morning, <laughs> wherever you are. You know, what this panel uh, will do is to sort of analyze uh, objectivity in perceptions around China. I mean, I must say that's really not an easy task, as it were, uh, you know, uh, if, if one were to ask that question today, uh, given the circumstances. But I must congratulate Media Rumble, uh, the team, uh, for asking the panel to think about a very important and pertinent topic uh, such as this. The question I think we are trying to answer today um, is, a, is, a, is an important one. From foreign policy to journalism, how objective or unbiased is China's perception in the world? But let me put it very, very, very bluntly and simply. Uh, we may or may not have issues with China. We may or may not like China, but we certainly cannot ignore China. Um, and, um, you know, China, by a lot of accounts, is on its way to becoming a, uh, a superpower. Um, so there is no way we can ignore that and the perceptions that we may have about China. Um, so some introspection is probably a good idea. So it is important to understand China. So the question is, uh, as, as the Media Rumble uh, team has uh, posed to us, is our understanding of China biased, unbiased, and we are we trying enough to understand China and its people? So since we have only 40 minutes with four uh, very distinguished panelists, we will do away with the initial remarks. I'll pose some um, thematic questions to the panelists and uh, sort of get their views. And then we'll have about 10 minutes or so for uh, question and answers. Let me, let me sort of begin with you, Professor Rajamohan. Um, you know, a 2020 a 14 country Pew Research Center survey shows that the views of China have grown more negative in recent years. An unfavorable opinion has soared over the past year. Today, a majority in each of the surveyed countries has an unfavorable opinion of China. And in Australia, the United Kingdom, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, United States, um, Canada, et cetera, negative views have reached their highest points since the Pew Research Center has began polling on this topic more than a decade ago. How do you explain such unpopularity uh, of an emerging superpower? Professor Rajamohan. No, the last few years, certainly under Xi Jinping, there's been a dramatic change of international perceptions. And that's not surprising because at least some clear uh, ways in which Chinese influence has manifested itself. Uh, to summarize what Peter said, uh, there is uh, territorial expansionism. Uh, there is uh, military uh, assertion. There is economic coercion. There is uh, diplomatic aggression and domestic repression. I mean, if you see all these features, I mean, have become much worse under Xi Jinping. And you don't have to be a China scholar. I mean, you're right. The awareness of China in the Indian media is limited. We still can't get the first names and last names right. Uh, so, Levin Jinping can still be said in our media. Uh, but, you know, so that, 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 that doesn't mean what you know, uh, you don't, it, a good peasant knows repression when he sees it, when he finds expansionism. So, there's no difficulty. I think while there is a general problem that we need to raise the level of awareness of China, uh, and its transformations that are taking place. But the basic features of a, of a more regressive China are, are out there for everyone to see. And that's the reason why across the world, uh, there is a significant uh, uh, deterioration of the perceptions of China. Uh, and then we've seen hegemons before. Uh, the Americans, if you say Europeans, you can, they'll talk about the Germans. Uh, uh, you can talk about the Japanese in Asia. Uh, we've seen a lot of hegemons before. But I think China's rise has been much swifter, more dramatic, and uh, a more dramatic change in the attitudes of China uh, to the rest of the world and the sense that they can get away with it, uh, which is, I think, unfortunate. But the Chinese will discover, I think, just as they have nationalism, uh, nationalism pretty deeply rooted in Asia in particular. So they will be pushed back. It could be weakest countries, but everyone is going to push back. And China's nationalism is not exceptional, and therefore, a Chinese, I think, have asked for it, and I think they're going to pay for it. Thank you. Um, Samia, sort of let me let me uh, bring that question to you from a slightly different angle. Do we understand China enough? Now, let me explain what I what I mean by that. China clearly controls how its 
it's people see the world uh, by controlling the social media and, and the traditional media. But does the party's tight control of the news emanating from China also indirectly shape how we understand that country? Um, and how do we sort of get past the this carefully choreographed image of China? You've been a journalist, you sort of reported from China. What's your, what's your sort of take on that? Um, first of all, good evening, and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'd like to speak from the point of view of an Indian journalist and an Indian woman journalist who happened to spend a year in Beijing in 2019. And I think uh, at a fundamental level, if I can make a broader point, we have to understand the amount of resources we've actually put in uh, when it comes to newsrooms sending foreign reporters around the subcontinent versus the one-person one bureaus that we send out to Beijing. China is a much, much bigger uh, country, and I am not entirely sure as Indian newsrooms, we actually put in uh, enough resources to understand and expand, uh, you know, uh, I suppose the foot soldiers on the ground for our understanding. Secondly is a gendered lens. Currently, every journalist, uh, Indian journalist reporting, reporting out of Beijing is a man. And therefore with that comes a specific kind of uh, point of view on the country, uh, be that a bilateral frame through which uh, the country is seen, Perhaps it is uh, what the foreign ministries are talking about each other and so on. Um, the more bigger question here is language. So while we've done a great job understanding the subcontinent, one thing that really restricts us from going further is Mandarin. Learning Mandarin, understanding Mandarin, and therefore being in a position to walk up on the street uh, to anyone like you do in journalism, show up to any place and ask questions. That's impossible unless you know the language. Um, I'd say our understanding is not enough. I think Indian newsroom should make a much uh, bigger sort of push to send more people there. Um, what I tried to do in my time there was to steer clear of what I thought was a very uh, you know, bilateral frame. By that, I mean, I spent most of my time there trying to explain China, Chinese culture and society from the point of view of the Chinese. Uh, I even try to not give you a reference to India. Let's go beyond that. And if I have to just explain to you how China looks. Um, is it difficult? Definitely. Uh, it's, it was very hard. Most of my reporting was restricted to English speaking Chinese people. There was no access to politicians or bureaucrats. That's impossible. There's a huge squeeze on information. And their version of journalism fundamentally is different to ours. So sometimes when you ask a question, it is like, but why is this even a question? because uh, you're clearly looking beyond uh, you know, what they think is, is you know, uh, how we see the world. Um, and I think the problem we make or the nuance we completely miss in Indian journalism, journalism or anywhere for that matter is we tend to conflate the CCP with the Chinese uh, people. This is like saying India is the Indian government. And I think that's uh, really inaccurate and it's a very narrow way of looking at it. Um, so I think like uh, uh, Mr. R uh, uh, Peter Ramel said at the beginning, there are different versions of China that we should spend time understanding. And that's beyond just the government, beyond just the actual you know, um, geopolitical version of the country. And I think a lot more needs to be done, at least in our understanding uh, from, from India on uh, how we see even similarities between the two. So that's right. relevant. Right, right. So, I, mean, I think I think that's that's an interesting point. I mean, the, the, the whole question of uh, the choreographed image that the CCP has presented about China for for the rest of the world. How do we sort of get past that? Uh, Swami, let me sort of bring that to you. Um, I mean, do we understand one China enough? And two, how do we get past this sort of carefully choreographed image of China? Iman, I am a little more worried today than I was a year ago, or maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, I am uh, beginning to um, see uh, the Chinese choreography extend to even external public spheres. So mm -hmm. I'm not even sure that it is just the Chinese people who they are curating now, but see their control over FT, New, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, and all the big media and, and university systems and um, uh, uh, journals, etc. We are seeing China curate its understanding for the world even in external territories. So I am not sure you are going to get an unadulterated view even outside China. And I think that's the new challenge that has come up. Xi Jinping is not just content in managing his own ecosystem. He wants to manage yours as well. 
So even if you were to engage on Chinese issues outside China, I suspect it might still be the Chinese dance you're performing. And I think that's something that's the new additional challenge we face when we seek to study China or have an objective conversation on China. I think Chinese conversations are generally biased in favor of China due to their immense clout, reach, and, and uh, 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 socialization of key institutions globally. The Chinese uh, have a saying, borrow a boat to go out to the sea. I guess they have borrowed all our boats and we are all at sea. I think that's the 20, 2020 scenario that uh, I think the 2020s is presenting to us. So that's one part. How do we really get to the truth? How do we have an objective conversation? How do we talk to um, uh, uh, folks uh, without biases or prejudices about uh, an actor who's very difficult to ignore or should not be ignored, like you mentioned in your opening remarks? You may like them, you may dislike them, but they are your reality. And for India, they are our neighbor. So they are a, they are a reality which is up close and personal. So that's one, one part of it. The second is that I think there is also a bit of a binary divide in those who want to study China and those who think it is not important to invest in that study. I think there's a divide here. And I'll tell you what the divide is. The divide is that somehow uh, there is a notion, and I, and I want to dispel this notion, somehow there is a notion that if you study China, you're trying to normalize their deviant behavior. And I think this must be dispelled. Even if you think China is your, uh, your enemy and is going to be inimical to your interests, it is even more important to study them. So in fact, if you see them as a danger, if you see them as a threat, if you see them as harming your interests, if you see them as expanding their political territories to your cost, if you see them amassing 100,000 troops on your uh, northern borders uh, summer after summer, I think it becomes even more of an imperative to spend more money in understanding uh, the nature of the beast. So I think uh, we must dispel this idea that study China means normalize China. I think study China is also a strategic tool that is extremely vital if you need to develop a comprehensive response to a relentless, expansive neighbor who is nibbling away at, uh, at your multiple fronts, uh, digital, uh, territorial, water, maritime. So you have to engage. It is a strategic imperative. It is not a, it is not a, a jholawala imperative that let's study China because it's fashionable. I think it is, it is an existential necessity for a country like India to invest in understanding uh, 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 someone who's standing at the gates. So that's the second part. And final point, uh, uh, Happy Moon, in my opening thoughts, is that uh, do we, uh, 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 this, and when we decide to study China, I think we have to understand there are two important, and there are many nuances, but two important nuances to keep in mind. One is long-termism, and one is short-termism. I think the study has to have both elements of it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you have a serial killer in town, uh, you can't do a long paper before you respond to the serial killer, right? It is, in, it is important to study why someone chose a certain path in life, why they became like that, what do they, where do they come from, what were the conditions that led them to uh, 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 become who they are. And that's a very interesting and important study to do. But there is also a short-term uh, 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 and tactical uh, study uh, that responds to the immediate. I think I don't have to understand China when they have 100,000 troops standing on my border. I have to find a response to that 100,000 troops. And there is a tactical dimension of studies. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What are the divisions within? What are the, uh, what are the forces and drivers and generals and individuals who are driving that formation? So, so there is a, there is a short-term and tactical study and research that must go into China, which we don't do, by the way, which we must do. And there is a longer-term study to understand the neighbor who you are going to live together, whom you are. And by the way, China is becoming so expensive that uh, uh, Berlin and Beijing are now border towns. So, I mean, they have taken their reach to the, to the borders of Europe. And in that sense, uh, all of us need to study that more. And I think, uh, therefore, there are two uh, uh, studies which are uh, important. One, I would say, is through much greater media proliferation, much greater academic proliferation, much greater um, strategic proliferation uh, 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 into various aspects of the Chinese state. And then there is a longer social, cultural, historical, and, 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 and um, uh, more um, strategic assessment of a long-term neighbor, partner, uh, enemy, for however you want to describe China. And I think uh, these need to be brought together to understand.
Uh, that's, that's absolutely well said, uh, uh, Samir. You know, in fact, uh, um, I can draw a parallel to our understanding of Pakistan here as well. I mean, in, in India, everyone is a Pakistan expert. But the reality is that how many universities and how many um, institutes have dedicated Pakistan studies divisions? How many of how, how many of them understand the internal politics in Pakistan? And the moment you start, uh, you know, studying Pakistan, there is this feeling that, oh, you're normalizing Pakistani behavior. I think you, you sort of uh, put, the, put hit the nail on the head when you said, Understanding China, studying China is not equal to normalizing Chinese behavior. I think I think I think that needs to be uh, underlined and emphasized. But Bill, let me let me sort of um, uh, come to you next. You know, I was reading about this internal um, uh, sort of uh, report circulated by uh, the China Institute of Contemporary International Relations, uh, which gave a grave warning to Chinese leadership. Uh, according to reports, apparently it concluded that global anti-China sentiment is at its highest since the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown. Now, China, therefore, uh, clearly not is not oblivious to the rising anti-China feelings. And yet, there seems to be little course correction uh, in CCP or in China. If anything, there seems to be more aggression. What, in your sort of uh, understanding, explains this sort of uh, uh, um, contradiction, as it were? Um, yeah, look, Australia, for those who have been paying attention, has had a huge falling out with China in recent years. And just five, six years ago, Australia was signing a free trade agreement. Uh, universities were getting closer and closer with research uh, funding. Uh, and the two biggest political donors to Australian politicians were two Chinese property billionaires. So that gives you an idea of just how close Australia was getting to China five or six years ago, maybe about seven, eight years ago, probably. But um, these days, relations are very fraught. And the main reason probably is that Australia is locking in more closely in its traditional alliance with the United States. And of course, China as an objective to, over time, push the US out of East Asia. But the other reason is that Australia has become very savvy about how the Chinese party state works. There are a lot of journalists, a lot of scholars, a lot of analysts who regularly uh, uh, write about this. There has been a very uh, lively debate in Australia. Often you have the business community who wants close ties to China for economic reasons. But then you now have increasingly uh, increasing voices of um, national security analysts and people who are very aware of how the Chinese party state seeks to influence democratic politics overseas, particularly in the Chinese diaspora community. So for that reason, the Australian government has taken a few measures in recent years to try and offset that sort of Chinese uh, interference. Uh, and that has really been um, taken very badly by Beijing, which has targeted Australian exports and various uh, other measures in response. So, um, yeah, how, how's the Australian public seeing all this? The current attitudes towards China are very poor over here. Uh, people are very unhappy with how Beijing has been treating uh, Australia in recent years, and I can't see relations getting any better. And uh, it's not just Australia. It's obviously uh, something that people in India are very familiar with uh, and uh, many other countries in the region. You know, it, it so appears that uh, they have probably haven't learned lessons from uh, the other uh, superpowers. I mean, if you look at the U.S. example, uh, the U.S. has, um, um, you know, tried to improve its image abroad, even while it sort of... Uh, um, you know, did things that it shouldn't have been doing. I mean, you know, that's been the example for Chinese. Uh, the Chinese state uh, certainly hasn't uh, uh, learned that um, uh, logic. But let, let me come to you, um, uh, Professor Raju Mohan, with a slightly different uh, question. I mean, taking on from what uh, uh, Samir said. Um, you know, uh, Professor Raju Mohan, you've been, you've been, you've been a, a teacher, a, a journalist, a commentator. You, you watched China for a a very long time. Um, how do you sort of assess the state of China studies in India or even in places like uh, Singapore? I mean, you are in Singapore these days. So um, do, 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 do we study China enough in India? I mean, you know, this is, again, picking up from what um, Samir said. I think that's an interesting and important question that needs to be addressed. 
No, compared to where I was when I joined the School of International Studies in 74, there's a lot more people studying China today in India, I'm talking about. So there is actually the number of people who can speak Mandarin in India, who spend time in China, uh, coming back and working as professionals in India. So there's a lot more knowledge about China in that sense, a lot more awareness. Otherwise, even right till the turn of the millennium, uh, you had one visit to China and say, you know, I went to China, this is what I saw. You know, this type of nonsense, we were, you know, as if it was some curiosity, you managed to go there, you saw cycles going everywhere, that kind of stuff. We romanticized a lot of that. But today there is no shortage of knowledge. Uh, that does translate into the mass media? No. Uh, in fact, again, I mean, if I go back to my period of growing up, there were more correspondents for every newspaper in every corner of the world than there are today. A Hindu, for example, had uh, Pallavi Ayer, who was a, a female. I mean, you had a lot more journalists posted abroad. But for the media, revenue model has changed. You know, they don't much, uh, and it, globalizing India devotes a lot less attention to uh, paying foreign reporters. Uh, so, so I think that is a paradox. But I think that, that that has changed. So, And the problem you identified, look, there is no expertise uh, in, in terms of, there is a shortage of expertise on all regions. Mm. There's Latin America, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. We've not invested uh, enough, uh, but China is too large. So whether you invest or not, China is going to affect you in a manner that Latin America might not. So in some senses, uh, that is that. But the China is the second largest economy. So more people are engaging with it. So more people are picking up stuff. Indians working in China. Uh, there's a lot more exchanges today in spite of the other, other problems. But I want you to caution against one thing. You know, expertise does not translate into good policy or good judgment. If expertise is all that you needed, the US won't have messed it up in Middle East, in Afghanistan, after blowing up $5 trillion, that you still get it wrong. With all the massive industry of IR, think tanks, or knowledge, no other country has as many Arabic speakers, as many people who are familiar with the Middle East than the US, but yet you screw it up. So, so I think uh, having expertise uh, and knowledge and, and good policy are not the same things. So there are a whole lot of other things. We should also differentiate between understanding a society, which is really investing in its history, culture, civilization, language, and the other, the state and public policy is immediately focused on what are the issues at hand. Is what is China doing on your borders? Uh, how is China's India trade deficit? Where is it taking you? So those are live issues. So it's not that one is uh, exclusion of the other. We have to uh, invest uh, in uh, in uh, in both. So my sense is, uh, I, I don't think we should worry too much. I think the the we need to put in more effort, and the media in particular needs to devote a lot more attention to what's happening in the world. And as I said, the more we globalize, the less we are interested in the world. And there are simplifications that are sold. And then you have the electronic media, which is just, I mean, dumbing down everything to a level where actually no reasonable discourse. Right. That's the problem, not how many experts do we have. I think that is the uh, issue I think we have today. Right. Um, you know, before I go to Soumya on the question of reporting China once more, you know, Samir, I, I sort of want, want to come back to you uh, once again, uh, picking up the point that you made early on um, in the discussion about, about sort of studying China. I mean, you, you, you uh, um, head one of the um, um, leading think tanks in India. And what has been your own experience or that of the Obser Observer Research Foundation in sort of uh, studying China, uh, the nuances of its politics or dissidents or culture, uh, what has been your experience? So, uh, happy one, I uh, agree with Dr. Raja Mohan uh, from a very narrow think tank perspective. I think more people are studying China in think tanks today than they ever were. Let's be honest here. Mm -hmm. And not only China, but uh, China and gender, China and tech, China and commerce, China and their rural development models. In fact, I remember uh, seven years ago, uh, sending a delegation of six or seven of my researchers to three villages in China to see and, and doing a comparative study with Uttarakhand and certain other uh, uh, rural uh, uh, you know, uh, habitats in India. So I think we are doing more than we ever did. And that's uh, true. Uh, I am not certain that what we do is necessarily uh, being received by those who make policies vis-a-vis -vis China. So I think there is, also a, a, there is also a knowledge gap between 
the production of knowledge and its application to create sensible policies. And I think Dr. Rajamohan is right that having knowledge and expertise does not necessarily mean that you come up with the right uh, policy responses. And I think in China, uh, we are still, again, even at the political and policy level, uh, we are still caught in the binaries, either you're a panda hugger, uh, the Indian version of it, or or you uh, see uh, see them as a, a, a you know existential threat, and uh, we are we still have not right sized uh, China. I think uh, Ambassador Osgotra many years ago when we were sitting in a research meeting at ORF, uh, you know once pointed to one of our young fellows and said, "Listen, they are not six feet, but they are not hundred feet either. So so you know get the size right." When you when you when you scope the dimensions of um, that particular challenge, no, so that's one part. But let me tell you, happy one. When I joined ORF, we had no Chinese uh, speaking scholar. We have three today, right? Uh, and uh, we have a larger constellation of external uh, contributors who speak Chinese. And we we commission papers, commission research, reach out to. We have a network of many uh, of those who watch China. In fact, if you go to our website, you will find a lot of Chinese ex researchers who have contributed to our own. Uh, understanding of the trade debates, the RCEP debates, uh, uh, even on uh, uh, thorny questions like BRI and and um, uh, Afghanistan, etc. So I think we are we are certainly doing more uh, uh, on China, uh, and I think um, in many ways I suspect what happened in the Himalayas last year is uh, a good opportunity for all of us to devote far more resources on on uh, uh, our, our northern neighbor. Uh, and and I see this as uh, something that is already beginning to happen, Happy One. So I think think tanks in India are definitely more invest uh, are investing more, and uh, we have. Um, I mean, for me, if you say I'm a China expert, I speak Mandarin. I give you a job even before I know anything else. So no, it's like that. You tell me I speak Mandarin, and I'm I I, I want to study China. I say come join us, right? right. And uh, if you know five thousand characters, you can be my boss also. So I am. I am very happy. I understand that you have to engage with this um, very important neighbor, uh, uh, and this is true for many institutions. That's that's the first part. The second is that I also think we face a we face a very interesting. Um, uh, 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 you know what? What do I say? A bottom line challenge. You know, once you know a bit of Chinese, and once you understand a bit of that continent or that society or peoples, uh, the private sector is going to grab you. You know the, the the returns that the private sector and commercial enterprises give to Chinese speakers in terms of salaries and and fees and and remuneration is very difficult for us to compete with if, if you are in a media house or in a think tank or even in a, a modest small strategic analysis firm. So I think we are also uh, the the, the uh, even as our relationships become more thorny, our um, uh, economic integration uh, remains, uh, uh, you know, top notch in terms of uh, India's uh, 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 global uh, footprint. So, in right. that sense, the commercial uh, owners are are going to gobble up the talent that we produce, and we are not producing sufficient. So, in a sense, uh, the globalizing India is globalizing in terms of its uh, its its business interests and its economic interests, not necessarily uh, creating the strategic heft to understand the world it plays in. And I think, therefore. Right. Uh, we require a far greater pool of resources so that it can cater to the commercial as well as the research and media interests uh, that uh, should be devoted to uh, China. Sorry, it's a long answer no. to a short question. No, no, but, uh, th thank you. I mean, but let's try and sort of uh, get into the nitty gritties of uh, understanding and reporting China. And I want to bring in Soumya and Bill here. Uh, Soumya, you know, tell us about how, how hard is it reporting from China? How free are foreign journalists uh, when it comes to reporting from uh, inside China, do you get unfettered access to individuals, especially those with a uh, critical view? Um, and and uh, what what about access to places like Tibet and, and Xinjiang? I'm speaking definitely from the year I spent there, and I'm sure Bill can weigh in uh, for a much longer stint in China. It's definitely hard. Um, everything goes through an official channel. If you want access to any kind of politician or bureaucrat, it has to be on email or a written sort of transcript sent to them saying this is the clear question. Uh, beyond that, I think what we saw last year was a good example. A whole bunch of American journalists were asked to leave in a, a week or 10 days. A lot of them uh, packed up very quickly, moved to Seoul, moved to Taiwan, uh, went back to the States. Some of them are actually here uh, in India, in Delhi. So, there is, uh, you know, knee-jerk reactions that are then aimed at journalists, especially foreign journalists. 
uh, because they provide a different narrative uh, to the way the world sees China. And whether you have access to Tibet and Xinjiang, much more difficult. I'm sure Bill can talk more about this. Um, wh while I was there, I tried uh, reporting on the uh, protests in Hong Kong and was not allowed. And when I went on holiday uh, there, I was told very clearly by other journalists to not record or uh, take images uh, on my phone, which might be checked when I'm uh, coming back into the mainland. So I think uh, there is a sense of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think the unknown in a bit of how this will be received, because I come from a context of the Indian press where things are a bit more, uh, you know, free. I have access to uh, bureaucrats and politicians, but that's not really the case there. And, and so there is also uh, the the visa being hung over your head. If you do any wrong in their eyes of a bad reporting, uh, then you've been asked to leave. Um, so I think uh, definitely things are getting harder and uh, they, they're really squeezing information from that perspective. Uh, you were asking about uh, Tibet. No, I mean, that's uh, off limits to foreign journalists uh, unless they are taken in on a government um, media trip. Um, so I was never able to go there. Xinjiang is, uh, you're able to fly into Xinjiang, but um, you're pretty much followed from not long after you arrive. Uh, so <laughs> there's a heck of a lot of police and undercover interference in Xinjiang. Um, just one thing I suppose I'd add. Um, one of the problems uh, now reporting in China is that the Chinese education system is incredibly effective at uh, fostering nationalism. And I am stunned just by how nationalistic China has become, particularly in recent years under Xi. Um, I obviously have an Australian outlook. We're not particularly nationalistic down here, but it is just in your face nationalism uh, promoted through media, through uh, digital media, through, through things like apps. Uh, there are you know, patriotic videos playing on the subways in Beijing every now and then. It just becomes normalised, of course, the education system too. And so being um, such a sort of nationalistic country, uh, foreign journalists have been completely stigmatised by the government. And there is a default understanding in China that the foreign media lies and is out to get China. And so any reporting that the foreign media does about China, the default position of many people you come across is no, 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 no. I don't care what you say, your foreign media, of course you're out to smear China. The government actively promotes this idea. Um, it's not dissimilar if you look at US elections and the, the Donald Trump supporters, um, the way many of them completely dismiss the mainstream media, no matter what it says about the Trump uh, you know, Mr. Trump, uh, it's very similar sort of idea. So from a starting point, this makes engagement uh, very difficult. It makes working as a journalist in China incredibly difficult. Um, and it, you just have to understand the Chinese state has been incredibly successful at um, normalising this idea from the outset that foreigners, foreign media are not to be trusted um, they're out to get China. It's it's such a negative negative way for China to engage with the world. But unfortunately, that's the starting point. And when you get something like the border clashes between India and China, whatever the Indian media says, people in China just straight off go, well, of course they'd say that. It's the Indian media. They're out to smear China. We don't care what they say. So I don't know if it was always like this. Of course, it's always been rather patriotic uh, under communism. But in recent years, I've been on the ground there and you've just seen it ramp up. It is really, really noticeable. Right. You know, Professor Rajamohan, um, it is easy It is easy for uh, the United States or UK or India and other big countries to sort of dismiss uh, the Chinese sort of mega project, the BRI initiative. Uh, but how is it viewed in, say, less developed or developing countries? Put differently, is the view of China uniformly shared across states, uh, let's say, I mean, barring uh, close strategic allies such as Pakistan, or is there a divide in the international community about how, how China is, is viewed? I think the, the divide is not between, uh, you know, developed or developing countries or, you know, uh, the, the divide is between elites and ordinary people. I mean, 
that what Chinese have been enormously successful, I mean, Chinese state, in elite capture, that is, uh, you can call it influence operations, you can call buying foreign leaders, you can say corrupting foreign leaders, that it can use, you know, funding, building presidential palaces, giving cuts on, uh, you know, project money. So they, they've done it, you know, enormously uh, in the last 20 years. So you have, even in Pakistan, where the Pakistani army says CPEC is a game changer, Imran Khan himself, before he became prime minister, was raising questions about CPEC. They were, he's saying, look, it's not too effective. Even today in Pakistan, there is a debate, if you care to notice, that's part of a lack of our Pakistan studies, that actually on the ground, the reactions against what Pakistan does, China does, its projects, we've seen it in Burma, we've seen it in large parts of Africa. So there is elite capture. So if you if you are uh, a, you know, Ruritania, you are a, you know, king, and you say, look, the Chinese give you better terms for the elite, not for the country. Uh, he'll say, look, fine. I mean, they're not giving me lectures on human rights. They're giving me money. I can use it for my own ends, and I'm fine. But somebody is paying the price. I mean, if you're willing to pay more interest rate to a Chinese project, you get into a debt trap. But it is somebody behind me is going to take care of it. And I think uh, that we've seen across the board. Uh, even the most friendliest states uh, to, to, to China, we've seen reactions at the ground level. But uh, as it, is it strong enough to translate into resistance? No. Uh, but in some places, yes. But we've seen in Burma, where the, you know, the Hadil projects, there was a lot of resistance. Uh, there was pushback. Projects were suspended. But today, when Burma is isolated by the West, they want to go back to the Chinese. So I think it's a, it's a dynamic interaction. But at the mass level, uh, there have been protests because Chinese don't generate employment. Uh, they bring their own people. Uh, and the condescension, I mean, you look, I mean, we're not the only racist in the world, and the Americans are not the only racist one. The Chinese are quite famous for it, too. I mean, the way they treat uh, brown and black people, I mean, it's pretty. Uh, and in Pakistan, we've seen uh, video footage where how they treat the local people. So I think money brings arrogance, and a uh, sense of cultural superiority also brings arrogance. And Chinese have all those problems. I think the difference between the Americans and their previous hegemon, shall we say, in the US, there is a recourse to alternative sources like the state. OK, you had the American president, you can say he's an idiot. Uh, you can go to the Congress, you can go to the media, you can go to opposition parties. In China, there's no recourse. So that's why it's enough to say, look, CPC must be separated from the rest of the society. But CCP has dominated the state, leaves no room. Look, I've been traveling to China since the late 80s. Uh, even 10 years ago, five years ago, you could travel far more in a relaxed fashion. You could talk to the academics privately, they would say a lot of things. And Samir and I, we have traveled, we've dealt with who... Hu Jishin, who is the Global Times editor, he came to RF. We went there, I and mean, you could have a reasonable conversation with them. China has changed. I mean, I think if you don't notice that, look, China has fundamentally changed. Chinese state, its behavior has changed under Xi Jinping because they think they've arrived, they have the clout, right. and the others have no alternative but right. to accept the dominance. And I think that's a reality, and I think people are dealing with it. So um, I think we have to now move to the um, uh, Q&A. There is this very interesting question now, uh, Professor Rajamon just mentioned about the CCP, but uh, I'm going to take that question to um, either um, Samir or Saumya. Is the dictatorship of uh, the CCP the only hurdle because of which other countries hesitate to engage with China? In other words, say there is a regime change in, in China. Um, will China be um, sort of different towards the world? Will the Will the world be different towards uh, China? I think I think that's a um, uh, larger philosophical question. But um, do, do you want to give it a try, uh, Samir? I mean, say from in, Indian perspective, I mean, is, is, is it the CCP you know, that's a problem? Is it China that's a problem? See, uh, I think let me uh, quote Ambassador Vijay Gokhale here, and uh, he says, like in uh, uh, Pakistan, the army has a state; in China, the party has a state, and I think. Uh, uh, to um, create a cleavage between them, the, the party and the state, uh, means changing the nature of the beast completely. And, and uh, uh, I think um, this then becomes just a moot point. Uh, the question that we need to ask is that are we going to see a dramatic change in the character of the CPC itself? And I think that's the question to ask. That, that, that will the CPC, and I think Peter mentioned it in his uh, 
in his opening uh, uh, comments that are we going to see a dramatic change in the way cpc engages with the world and is this only a xi jinping phenomenon so uh, are we going to see a different uh, summer uh, once xi jinping um, uh, is no longer in charge or have we seen an irreversible um, move towards a muscular party that uh, uh, is hell bent on using technology media enterprise and politics and security for the benefit of the party agenda and i think that's the question right. that right. is the party agenda now so institutionalized and unshakable that only a disintegration of the political system of china can make it a responsible actor or do we still have a ch chance that the cpc itself evolves uh, like the americans did by the way that itself evolves Uh, and becomes a far more reflective and and uh, engaged organization with the outside i need to make one short point uh, happy mon i think uh, uh, comparing chinese hegemony and american hegemony is a false debate now uh, 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 americans uh, uh, have been brutal in the way they have destroyed civilizations let's be very clear they have, they you know they used to be a country called iraq right so uh, so they have been absolutely um, uh, uh, barbaric in conduct of uh, uh, foreign policy uh, to to defend further their own interests let's be very honest about it but like uh, dr rajamohan mentioned uh, and ashley dellis has famously coined that america was a penetrated democracy that uh, that although it was the hegemon and although it decided what it wanted to do around the world you could go and stand outside the white house and raise slogans and uh, ask for tobacco to be banned or or firearms to be banned or ask for anything you could lobby their congress you could lobby their pr firms you could create advocacy groups right. even from your own country they allowed their own democracy to be penetrated by everyone so while they were a global hegemon their democracy was allowed to be gamed by every uh, person the chinese gamed it the best that's a separate topic but but they allowed their democracy to be gamed now if you want to uh, protest against a policy of xi jinping where, where do you go and hold that placard where do you stand Uh, uh, showing my disapproval for Xi Jinping policy. Where do I? Who do I lobby for in China to get that policy changed of the Chinese for uh, their approach to Afghanistan or oil or uh, climate change or more? So I think um, unless China allows a framework where global criticism can reach it and can engage with that, like the Americans did, the Chinese will always be a muscular state and will continue to see growing uh, discordant voices against its. Uh, press right. right. if it is able to allow criticism to reach it and create the receptacles to have dialogues with those who disagree with it uh, then we will see that new cpc regime emerge and i think that's the question we need to think about right uh, very quickly bill and uh, somio if you have any thoughts on this particular question about uh, i mean you both have seen the people and you have dealt with the party inside china uh, where where do you where do you stand on this particular question uh, the ccp um or no ccp china is going to be what it is or is it going to be different i can weigh in really quickly just about sort of a tangential point to taking a placard and uh, protesting against the party itself but if you uh, just zoom out to see a the nature of protests itself those are happening in the last year i've been an ashoka university fellow studying uh, food delivery platforms in india and china and uh, have tracked in some detail uh, protest from gig workers in china which is quite rampant across several uh, chinese cities so when the point i'm trying to make is that protests do happen for related issues and the government does actually take those into account and if it's gotten into a point that it cannot be contained uh, it even does uh, affect policy so one i can think of is gig workers in the food delivery sector environmental protests as well and the use of the internet basically to express dissent i think we are under the impression that uh, a lot of chinese people do not have anything to say against their government but there is a very uh, you know uh, you know counter culture that is apparent and is uh, completely taking over the internet in many phases uh perhaps we don't know how to read that because we are not from the same culture but i think it's important to point out uh people are calling out the government in various ways right thanks bill any any uh thoughts on that that particular question oh yeah just uh, quickly to add that um uh even though the chinese government appears to be trying to make public discussion in china 
as uniform as possible. Um, it, it's uh, very much, as uh, Samir said, um, there's a lot more bubbling under the surface. But at the end of the day, for other countries and the way that they engage with China, uh, how much does that really matter when you have civil society groups that now really can't have foreign links because of a, a foreign NGO law, which prohibits uh, NGOs uh, receiving foreign funding and things like that. Um, if, you're, if you're another country and you're trying to deal with China, you do have this massive problem where the government does have such an iron grip on you know all facets including civil society um so you know maybe 10 years ago five years ago it was easier to reach out to those uh, various interest groups in china um these days it's once again getting harder and harder thank no, you happy, uh, just a, uh, happy just a quick intervention i i yeah. did not to imply that you uh, don't have chinese uh, debates on uh, uh, their uh, chinese twitter and on social media and on the platform. I think it's a very vibrant uh, governance related conversations, incidents, um, you know, eve teasing, uh, uh, injustice, all sorts of issues are discussed on, on their own social media platforms. My question is, uh, a global hegemon is not about Chinese discussions on their policies. A global hegemon requires international uh, voices to be able to protest against the Chinese in China, right. in Beijing, in standing before the, uh, the court of uh, Emperor Xi Jinping. And that is not there today. So uh, yeah. I, I don't care what they do with their own citizens. But if I dislike Chinese policy, I don't have a recourse to it, uh, unlike what, uh, say, the Americans offered uh, uh, others when they were at the peak of their global power. Fair, fair enough. So, um, uh, Professor Rajamon, very quickly, I mean, there's a very interesting question from Sanjana. How does the Chinese scholarship differ from, say, Asian scholarship or the Eurocentric perspectives on China? Is there a prevalent narrative that exists both in the media and research. I know it's a huge question, but if we can sort of... Uh, no, uh, I, mean, it yeah. quickly. I think to take the point where Samia talked about, look, I mean, Chinese themselves list how many protests have taken place each year. There are thousands of them they list. Uh, the Internal Security Bureau constantly lists every year so many protests. Right now, Evergrande, the collapse of the big real estate company, people are saying, give me money back. Uh, so those kind of protests have been fairly common. I've got land, the expansion of uh, capital into agrarian land. I mean, these protests are well documented, unstudied. But if there is a professor in Beijing University who says, look, Xi Jinping is going crazy, he's trying to accumulate too much power, he's sacked. So I think, you know, we've got to differentiate at what level, I mean, the protests, are they consequential? Look, all repressive societies have humor, have those cat and mouse games on the internet. Winnie the Pooh can't be said, so people will find different ways of saying it. That is human beings constantly, you know, reacting against state power. But the Chinese have, had, I think, created a state today that is far more repressive. I mean, from people we've interacted with, academics who talk a lot more, I mean, five years ago, today they don't. Yeah. That is a change. And I think there is a repressive mode internally. And, and I think you're a political scientist. You say, look, democracies don't go to war, you say, because internally there is counter positions and, and uh, the how the calculations go is, is, is more complicated. So I think Chinese have a problem, I think, but I would finally agree with Samyan. China has politics. Those politics are not going to be repressed for too long. China has always had domestic politics. I don't think Xi Jinping is an emperor. He's abolished politics. There is a post-politics China. There is not. There will be politics. There will be contestation. And you're going to see, it's a matter of time, when you will see the internal dynamic uh, against the hegemonic, internal hegemon who's at Thank you, Professor Rajamon. I mean, we sort of, um, um, uh, we just don't have any more time left to take any more questions. So I will basically say that I think we've had a, a fantastic discussion. I think what clearly comes out of this discussion, at least to my mind, is that uh, um, if indeed there is a biased perspective about China in the, in the world, that is also because of Chinese, uh, um, um, you know, control of the media, uh, of how, I mean, as, as, as Samir put it, uh, they are not just controlling um, how their citizens think. They are also trying to control how the rest of the international community um, thinks about thinks about China. I think that's where that's where really the problem is. But I think, again, as as, as uh, Professor Rajamon said, um, you know there is a uh, policy uh, study policy divide on China, right? I mean, you, know, you you may you may you may do all kinds of studies on China, but does that necessarily translate into policy? And a view also um, echoed by um, uh, Samir. But I think at the at the end of the day, um, you know this this distinction that is made about uh, state versus society. Um, you know, just because you 
have differences of issues with the difference of opinion um, uh, with the, the, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, Xi Jinping does not mean that you don't study China. I mean, that's all the more reason why you study China. As, as Samir put it so elegantly, um, you know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you have the enemy next door, you better know all about your, your, your enemy or adversary. I think so there's all the more reason why our universities um, should study China more. Uh, and I think tanks like Warab um, um, is already doing, but should, should do more work on China and our, and our, our media personalities um, should go beyond mere shouting matches and try and understand the, the real China. But thank you uh, so much, uh, all of you, for joining this um, very interesting session.